Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have an extra special guest. Sean Dobson has really had a fascinating career as a real estate investor, starting pretty much at the bottom and working his way up to becoming a uh, investor in a variety of mortgage-backed securities, individual homes, commercial real estate, really all aspects of the finding, buying, and investing in, in real estate. Uh, and on top of that, he's pretty much a, a quantitative geek. So he is looking at this not simply um, from the typical real estate investment perspective, but from a deep quantitative analytical basis. Uh, if you're interested in, in any aspects of commercial, residential, mortgage backed real estate, then uh, you should absolutely listen to this. It, it, it's fascinating. And there are a few people in the industry who not only have been successful as investors, but also very clearly saw and warned about the great financial crisis coming because it was all there in the data, if you were looking in the right place, and continues to build and expand the Amherst Group into a real estate powerhouse. I found this conversation to be absolutely fascinating. And I think you will also, with no further ado, my discussion with Amherst Group's Sean Dobson. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So, so let's talk a little bit about your career in real estate. But before we get to that, I just got to ask, uh, on your LinkedIn, under education, it says, didn't graduate, none, working for a living. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I think I answered questions of, uh, of uh, when did you graduate? And so I said, I didn't graduate. And then it was your, what degrees did you achieve? And I said, none. Right. Uh, and, then it, and then I think the question was, you know, what were you doing or what were your interests in? So I was working for a living. <laughs> but, I, but I didn't go to college. Did not go to college. Uh, right. Um, so that leads to the next question. What what got you interested in real estate? It was uh, it was happenstance. I, I took a temporary job at a brokerage firm in Houston, Texas, uh, the summer after high school, between high school and college, mm -hmm. really as the office runner, you know, running around, picking up people's dry cleaning, grabbing lunch, opening the mail, that sort of thing. And I took the job um, really because a friend of ours, a friend of the family's had worked there and just said what an interesting sort of industry it was. Uh, this is back when mortgages were sort of a backwater of the fixed income market. So they were traded a little bit like muni bonds. They're not really well understood, not well followed. Um, 1990s most, or 1987. before? 1987. Wow. 1987. So after that, it was, um, I later was given some opportunities to join the research team. Uh, and then took over the research team and then took over the, uh, eventually took over the trading platform. And then by 1994, a group of us had start, started our own business. And that's, that's the predecessor to Amherst, which we bought in 2000 and have been running it uh, since then. So, so when you say you were running the trading desk, you're running primarily mortgage-backed securities? That's that, mortgage-backed securities, yeah, exactly. Anything else, swaps, derivatives, anything along So back then it was really just mortgage-backed securities and structured products that were derivatives of mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. We sort of carved out a name for ourselves in, in, in quant analytics around mortgage risk. And that's still a big uh, core competency of Amherst is understanding the risks of mortgages are kind of boring, but they're also very complicated. The, the borrower has so many options around when to refinance, how to repay, if to repay. Um, it takes quite a lot of of uh, research, quite a lot of modeling, quite a lot of data to actually keep up with the mortgage market. It's really 40 million individual contracts, 40, 50 wow. million individual contracts, and a million different securities. So it takes quite a lot. It, it's, we've built an interesting system to allow you to sort of monitor all that and price it in real time. So, so if you're running a, a desk in the 2000s and you're looking at mortgage-backed and you're looking at securitized mm -hmm. product, one would think, especially from Texas, as opposed mm -hmm. to being in the thick of, of Wall Street, you might have seen some signs that that perhaps the wheels are coming off the bus. Tell us about your experience in the 2000s. What did you see coming? Yeah. So so from the late 80s until the really the late 90s, we were focused primarily on prepayment related risk in agency mortgage backed securities. By the time you get to the early 2000s, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Jimmy were losing market share. A lot of mortgages were coming straight from originators and going and being packaged into what later became the private label securities market. So as part of our just growth, we attacked that market. And up until that moment in time, 
we didn't spend a lot of time on credit risk in mortgages. We didn't really have to model credit risk because that was that risk was taken by the agencies. But in these private labels, you had the, the market was taking the credit risk. So we took the exact same modeling approach, which is loan level detail, borrower behavior, st- uh, stochastic processes, options-based modeling. And we said, let's just take a little detour here and make sure we understand the credit risk of these things before we sort of travel, start making markets and banking and, and, and um, really making these a core part of our business. At that time, this market was about a third of all mortgages were the ones where the credit risk was going into the capital markets. So that little detour was in 2003. And, mm-hmm. and we found a couple of things. We modeled, uh, pre, we modeled defaults the same way we model prepayments, which is a, an option for the consumer to not pay. Most people, <laughs> most of it. Rarely hear it described that way. Well, it's, it's, it's a unique approach, right? And, and it was u- unique at the time. Um, and so we, we thought there were conditions under which the option probably should be exercised. You know, if you, if you have a, a two hundred. If you have a two hundred thousand dollar home and a hundred thousand dollar mortgage, and there's and the consequence for not paying is a ding on your credit report, you're probably not supposed to pay. Is is the position we took? So through that lens, we said, okay, let's price these securities, and we found a bunch of, of interesting things. For for example, we found that the the follow on rating surveillance for mortgage backed securities um, doesn't follow the same ratings methodology that the initial rating does. So over time the risk composition of the pool would, would change dramatically. So think about 2003, home prices had gone up a lot from 2000. So mortgages issued in 2000 were way more valuable in 2003 than they were when they originated mm-hmm. because they weigh less credit risk. Um, not the same, the same thing couldn't be true as, as you went forward in time. Each subsequent vintage became riskier and riskier, became as, riskier, and riskier. as prices went up because rates had gone lower and lower. And that's the way we thought about it. So the way we think about it, when you make someone a loan, this is, this is sort of the, the credit OAS world. So when, you think about it, when you make someone a loan on a building, whether it's this building or, or a home, you're implicitly, in the United States, you're implicitly giving them the, the option to send you the keys. Right. So Jing- jingle mail is what we used mail. to call exactly. it. Exactly. And so we, we thought it was, we said, okay, we've been pricing complicated options our whole career. So let's just price the option to default as if it is a financial option. Uh, when you do that, and then you looked at the types of loans that are being originated, and this is where Amherst's story is a little different than some of the, the stories you've seen around the financial crisis. What we figured out was that the premium that you were being paid as this option seller was way below the fair market price of the premium, mm-hmm. meaning that the, the default risk you were taking was way higher than the market had appreciated. So they were underpricing default risk dramatically. And then as we dug in and dug in and dug in, we realized that there were a lot of loans that were really experiments. They were financial experiments where mm-hmm. the borrower hadn't been through due diligence, the, the LTV was very high, the underlying risk of the home market was very high. Um, By the way, these were the no doc or ninja loans. These were limited doc, no doc. Right. No uh, income, no uh, job, no assets. Were <laughs> exactly. Ninja. No, no pulse. Seems, seems reasonable. Yeah, exactly. So you look back at these things, you're like, how could it happen? But we're, we're loan level people, right? So we don't see the mortgage backed securities market as a market. We see it as, like I said, about 50 million assets. And we're modeling up the value of every home in the country every, every week, basically. And we're modeling up the value of every mortgage in the country. And we're modeling up the value of every, every derivative of that mortgage, the structured products and so forth. So through our lens, it was like, OK, we've made these financial experiments. The underlying real estate has become very volatile. So we could construct trades that had very, very low premiums to sell this volatility, to, to basically join the consumer on their side of the trade, which is, in essence, buying insurance on, on the bonds that were exposed to these great risk. So we, bu- we did that for a lot of the markets. So a lot of the headline names you see, a lot of the stories you see about, about the financial crisis, a significant number of, of those investors, we were helping in security selection, modeling, and analytics. So that, that sort of put Amherst on a different pact because prior to that, our core business model was investment banking, brokerage, market making, and underwriting. Um, by the time we got to 2005 and figured out that there was a, such a large sector that was so mispriced, we started hedge funds, opportunity funds. We took sub mandates from the big global macro hedge funds, and we started to build our model around uh, investing in our research, co-investing our research, and earning carried interest in sort of big, complicated trades that we thought we had figured out um, the market, maybe the market hadn't priced something properly. How, how did that end up working out? It, it was a wild ride. It was a wild <laughs> ride because by the time you got, well, so in 2005, we went on a road show uh, trying to tell people what we had learned. And there wasn't a lot of reception. We, we literally- let me, let me interrupt you and ask you, did, did people laugh at you? They were more polite than that, okay. but they didn't invest. <laughs> so right. so there, there were very few people that thought, because at, at that time, 
the trailing credit performers for U.S. single-family mortgages Great. was impeccable. Right. Impeccable. I, I want to say 05 was where we peaked in price and 06's volume, or am I getting that So 06, 05, 06, it started to turn over. And our thesis on a lot of these mortgages and the very, very uh, exposed securities within these structured products wasn't that home prices needed to go down. It was that the only way that the loan was going to perform is if, is if the consumer prices. could refinance out of it quickly. Right. So you really just wanted the music to stop, right? And or if I mean this whole thing was going to come down if the music stopped, right? So the by the time the music stopped, it was pretty apparent. But we had it. Uh, there's a there's a big industry conference called AFS that happens twice a year, and in the two thousand at the two thousand five conference, it's kind of wild. So these big brokerage firms get together, and they set up a convention like like plumbers, and they all give out tchotchkes, and they have a and then they give presentations of their business. And so we participated in this. Our tchotchke that year was a hard helmet, was a an amber, <laughs> was an orange hard hat, and it right. said "Beware of falling home prices." And our whole thesis was that was what I'm trying to describe, which is that's that, some great swag. Do you yeah. do you still have? A I few have of one those? in my office now. That's I have awesome. I have a I have a helmet from "Beware of falling home prices," and I have one for our new construction division where we build entire neighborhoods. So, <laughs> and that's really the to, to sort of bring it all together with this core competency and analytics and we're probably the only maybe not the only but but i don't know of a a competitor we're we're the quant shop in real estate and the quant shop in physical assets so with that core competency that's the reason we're in the single family rental business so you follow that all the way through there were amazing trades to do amazing opportunities wild scary things to do i got to spend a lot of time in dc consulting on the response to the financial crisis and trying to sort out sort of what was really going on and what we figured out in 2009, really, when we started buying homes, is that we made the bet that, it, I mean, it wasn't a very exotic bet, but we made the bet that the subprime mortgage market wasn't coming back at all. So wait, let, let me unpack some of that, because there's sure. a lot of really interesting things. When you mentioned D.C., I'm aware mm-hmm. of the fact that you briefed Congress, the Federal Reserve, the White House. Yeah. Who, 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 who else did you speak to when you were there? What, so, what was that experience So like? I lived in Washington, D.C. for five years. My family and I moved to McLean, Virginia in, in, in 2008. So we were down the street, and we were in a pretty interesting situation because we were, the, we were one of the biggest, if not the only, investment banks specializing in the core risk that the nation was facing, and we didn't need any help. Right. So we weren't there looking for changing of a reg cap, you know, of anything. We weren't looking for a bailout. We were looking for a recapitalization or anything. We were just there as a source of information. So we, we met a lot of, of interesting people in D.C. And it was the whole gamut. We were consulted on the recapitalization of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. We participated in that with Treasury and FHFA and uh, the regulators, the White House. Uh, and I would say that Washington was pretty interesting because we had gone and, and spoken to people in 2005, 2006, and to kind of let people know that there was something, you know, th- these are this is a trillion dollars worth of mispriced risk, right? Right. And and I I very vividly recall 06, even 07, people were, hey, we're in the middle of a giant boom. Why do you have to come, you know, rain on our parades? Yeah, what, was, what was your experience? It, it was lonely. I, I I tell you, the analogy was something like this: is that we had seen what had happened, and by 2006 it was over, right? The the mortgages were defaulting. People were taking out mortgages and defaulting in the third payment, the fourth payment. 90-day warranty on those um, non-conforming, non-Fannie Mae mortgages from those private contractors, like a toaster comes with a longer (laughs) warranty. It's amazing. So so eventually, even that was gone. Even that, they wouldn't provide 90-day warranty. Eventually, it was take it uh, cash for keys or cash to carry. So like for us, it was weird, though, because the analogy I give is that in 2006, it happened. It was over. First quarter of 2006, the market was, was over. Um, the market kept issuing securities, and, and I think the analogy that we, we think about is that if you're standing, if you're sitting in front of a bank, and you know a, a van rolls up, and people with masks run in, and they empty out the bank, and they leave with all the money, and you see it, and then people keep coming and going from the bank for another year, <laughs> you're like, you know, there's, keep no, making there's deposits. no money in that bank, right? <laughs> and so, so we sort of felt pretty stupid for a while because we did a lot of losing trades in 2006 that were the, you know, that obviously didn't come to fruition until the actual. People could see the losses. So in mortgages, the borrower can stop paying maybe a year to two years before the lenders actually book a loss. So there's this great lag mm-hmm. in, in housing that is affecting the market. It's fe- affecting today's CPI numbers uh, that the market doesn't do a great job of adjusting the real time for information that they already have. So when the borrower hasn't paid in 12 months, probably not going to get back the loan, probably not going to start paying again. And then you can model up what happens. Like, what's the home going to sell for? What are my expenses to sell for? How long is it going to take? And all of a sudden, you have a loan that was 
worth you know 100 cents on the dollar now it's worth 30 cents on the dollar and you knew that eight months into the loan or eight or maybe a year ago or two years ago but, but it takes that long to but write it takes it down. that long for the losses to get through to the securities and so i don't know if it's sort of just the fact that we're so myopic into the minutia of each little detail or if it's the fact that the market kind of doesn't want to buy an umbrella until it starts raining right huh really really very fascinating um so so coming out of this in 09 home prices on average across the country down over 30 percent but really in the worst areas like las vegas and south florida and you know parts of California phoenix. and parts of Arizona phoenix two, right two thirds in phoenix unbelievable yeah. so so you say i have an idea let's buy all these distressed real estate and rent them out yeah i had i had a very good idea so i have very good partners are very patient with me and i said okay i we don't think the subprime mortgage market is coming back which was a non consensus view at the time people were buying up mortgage originators and things waiting for the machines to sort of get turned back on <laughs> we were thinking this is investors are never going to buy these loans again at any price so what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the homes? And what's going to happen to the to the people that were living in these homes? And what a lot of people, I think, didn't follow is that you know, there was a concept that job losses called mortgage, caused mortgage defaults. But in the Amherst view, a, a mortgage default can be rational, as, as distasteful as it may sound. Right. And when I give this presentation in Europe or, the, or the, the EU or the UK, they look at me like you're crazy. Or in Australia or in Canada, they're like, what do you mean mortgage is a recourse? And so I'm like, well... Not in the US. Well, actually, some states are recourse and some states are not. What I like to tell people is that one person's default you have, you can handle, but when seven or eight million people default, we don't have debtor's prisons, right? right. They're, they're recourse. I mean, they're not recourse. So in this, in this context of, of a mortgage now being clear to everyone that this default risk is present, it's real, and it's hard to price because following the borrower's economic profile, there, there are defaults that are related to just life events, but there's also defaults related to a macroeconomic event. So we took the position, you know what? Investors are not gonna buy these loans anymore. The homes are here, and the, the job loss wasn't as big as the mortgage defaults were, right? So the people still had jobs, they still had revenue, and the homes were very affordable now because the prices have been reset. So we, we asked ourselves, okay, we've seen this movie before. Can we, uh, at Amherst, make a $300,000 home investable to a global financial investor? Which I, we spent our whole careers turning a $300,000 mortgage investable in the global capital markets. So we said, okay, this is probably not a long putt for us because we've been following the mortgage with all this minutia for 30 years. Now we're just gonna follow the house the same way. So we took our same analytic and modeling team and we said, let's press down one more level so we can actually price the home instead of the mortgage with precision. And then let's set up an operating capability that allows us to acquire the homes, renovate the homes, manage the homes, and then more importantly, scale the homes into an investable pool. So we created pools of homes just the same way we created pools of mortgages in 1989. So are you keeping these homes and leasing them out or are they flips for so they're So word? they're kept and leased out. And so, so starting in 2009, we, we, there was no flip market. There was no, no one to sell them to because <laughs> the mortgage market had basically for, closed on right. a, large, a large section of the consumer base. So think about- And that, that credit market was frozen pretty much And it's still frozen for most people. Right? So really, the, still yeah, so today? Still today. Basically, the barrier to entry to getting a mortgage became irreversibly higher. Um, and we spent a lot of time, so you mentioned my time in DC. I, went, I got to go and brief the Federal Reserve, which is kind of cool. I got to go into the FOMC room and I got to sit with, with uh, Yellen and Bernanke and walk them through, kind of, in our view, how we got here and the best way out. And I asked them not to shut down the subprime mortgage market because it does serve a large swath of the American public who has a slightly higher a rent to income or debt to income ratio or has defaulted on a credit card in the past or something, but they can pay. They've had a problem in the past, they've cured it. Well, those people now are pretty much blocked out of the mortgage market. So I was unsuccessful in talking people in, and still to this day, unsuccessful into talking to people to get back into lending to lower credit quality consumers because you can do it, you can risk base price it. So we took, the, we took the view like, hey, that market's not coming back. People are not going to listen to us. They're not going to say there are some good subprime loans and some bad subprime loans. They're just, gonna, they're just going to draw a line and say, you have to have a credit score above a certain level. You have to have income above a certain level. You have to have a debt load below a certain level. Or the price for you is zero. You just you, The answer is no. You're out of the market. You used to, you would say you would pay 1% more or 2% right. more. Now you said no. Huh. So, so, that, so that's how we, so then we said, okay, well, how's this going to work? And we had seen this movie before, aggregating mortgages, strapping services you know, on them, 
getting them rated, getting them available to the global capital markets. So we also saw the conflicts and the frictions of the mortgage market when it went under duress. The, the problems with getting service to the consumers, the problem with getting service to investors, the litigation, a lot of people don't know it, but we, were, we represented a large swath of the U.S. investor base in their litigation for buying these busted securities. So we said, you know what, let's just build under one platform everything you need to originate, manage service, aggregate, and then long-term service these homes on behalf of the residents and the investors. So that's the, that's the single family rental platform we built. Huh, absolutely fascinating. So let's talk a little bit about uh, who the clients are for Amherst. I'm assuming it's primarily institutional and not retail. T tell us who your clients are and, and what, what they want to invest in. Sure. O over the years, we've migrated really um, to what I would say is the largest customer base in the world, the largest in single investors. So we, we um, do business with most of the sovereign wealth funds, most of the big U.S. national insurers, global insurers, the largest pension funds. And we, we try to position ourselves as an extension of their capabilities. And since we're smaller, more nimble, we can kind of get in there and do some of the gritty things, the smaller things. Imagine setting up a platform with you know, in 32 markets that has to buy each individual home and execute a CapEx plan on a thirty, forty thousand dollar $40,000 CapEx plan on a home. So these large investors need someone like us to kind of make things investable in scale. And so that's that's where we've been. So it's all institutional investors. It's it's the, call it 500 largest investors in the world. Is that patient capital? Do, the, do they have the bandwidth to, hey, we're, we're in this for decades. Yeah, it's time. super patient. It's super sophisticated. They're asset allocation model driven uh, folks. Um, the bulk of our investors are investing on behalf of consumers, on behalf of taxpayers. So we, we're partners with the state of Texas, the actual state of Texas, not mm -hmm. one of the pension funds, but the state itself. So we have a lot of the, you know, sovereign wealth fund types that are investing on behalf of taxpayers. So it's very long dated capital. They're, they're lower risk tolerance, I would say. Um, very high standards on quality of service and quality of, of infrastructure and decision making. So we're very proud that we're a, you know, a partner to, to that type of capital. So, so let's talk a little bit about the residential side before we look at the commercial side. Um, you mentioned you are in 32 markets buying single family homes. Right. How many homes have you guys? So purchased? the platform services about fifty thousand units now. So we've, wow. we've purchased, and, and most of the homes were purchased one at a time. Mm -hmm. Independent due diligence, independent construction management to get the home back up to current market standards, and we manage each home, you know, independently. So that implies that some of the homes you're you're buying are kind of project homes, or wrecked or or otherwise neglected. Doesn't even have to be a willful act of destruction. Just time and tide. Just what we like to say is it's it's deferred capex. So you'll find that owners that have owned the home for 10, 15, 20 years become pretty comfortable right. with a smudged paint or a stained floor or old countertops or appliances that may make noises at, ni at night um, or that or that uh, you know that bathroom set that leaks and whatever. And so people just get comfortable in their homes and they they tend not to reinvest in real time on keeping that home up to current market standards. So we buy those homes that haven't really been touched in 15 or 20 years. They've still got the original builder interior. Um, we make sure that, of course, that the bones of the house are good, the foundation and the walls and so forth. But then we pretty much strip them down to, I wouldn't say down to the studs, but down to the sheetrock mm -hmm. and put a brand new interior in them. We, oftentimes people don't buy a roof. They'll, they'll let the roof go longer than, than maybe Just they Just staple a new one on exactly. top or a third one. So or... we buy a lot of roofs. We buy a lot of HVACs. We take out a lot of uh, compressors that are still running on those old toxic uh -huh. gases. So we basically bring the home up to a current modern standard. And there's a there's a profit in that. The, the home, you get paid to go and improve a piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. And then how do you figure out what to lease these for? And do you ever sell any of these homes? We do sell. We do. The platform is pretty nimble. So if, if uh, for example, we were talking before the show, we were talking about how some markets have really benefited from the post-COVID migration. Mm -hmm. um, and it's changed their, their customer base dramatically. So think about Naples, Florida, and Clearwater, and those types of places. So in those places, home prices, uh, since pre-COVID are up maybe 40, 50%, and rents are up 20, 25%. So they really don't really make much There's sense anymore answer. as a as a rental investment. So we're cleaning those homes back up and selling them back to the consumers. So that's an active part of portfolio trimming and, optim and optimization. And it's cool to have the capability to, to sort of execute in both markets. So it's funny you mentioned uh, Naples and Clearwater. A few of the areas adjacent to those 
really got shellacked by that last hurricane that came through last year. Yeah. Uh, what do you do when you have a natural disaster? Is that um, does that create any interest, or is it just just oh, too much mayhem. It's uh, well, we've been hit by hurricanes several times, floods several times, tornadoes several times. If, given that the homes are in thirty markets, the good news is no one event has a big impact on the portfolio. The bad news is all events you get to experience. Right, <laughs> so you're diversified, which means you're embracing every natural right. disaster. So in Houston, in one year has. we got hit in Houston and in <clears throat> Florida at the same time, mm-hmm. two different hurricanes. So what's interesting is that now we have a natural disaster team and response unit and a playbook which is a little bit unfortunate that you have to have that, but we use it every couple of years now. Mm-hmm. Um, we tend not to invest when those markets are busted. Um, we, we do see a lot of demand for our rentals because when you know a few percent of the housing stock gets taken offline for a storm, sure. it creates pressure on demand. But now our job is just to go in there and get the homes fixed as fast as we can and get them back into service. So 50,000 homes, I'm going to assume you're a self-insurer on all those homes? We do. So Amherst is completely vertically integrated. We own our own insurance platform. Huh. Um, so we're the, we're, you know, we basically access our coverage through the reinsurance markets. Mm-hmm. At our scale, it's hard to go get insurance through the normal channels. And so we set up our own insurance brokerage and risk retention platform. And now we, we insure uh, through the uh, reinsurance markets. Huh, really very, very intriguing. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about mm-hmm. some data and technology you use. Sure. You guys created your own platform. Tell us a little bit about what it was like developing that and what makes it specific and unique to yeah. Amherst. It's interesting because you know today we talk about AI and and uh, you know high speed computing and what, what I look at what we do as being comically you know simple compared to what we talk what we're talking about today with generative AI. But when we started this in the late '80s, so that was the job I was promoted into, which was, hey, let's figure out how to differentiate pricing from one mortgage pool to the next. They've got different interest rates, they've got different LTVs, they've got different credit scores, they must have different values. So I was part of a small, or the you know, our team was part of a small group of people tackling this problem in the late 80s, early 90s. And what we do today is just now growth of that original project. So it's a quantitative analytics approach. It's highly data-driven, but we need to know the price history for assets, the correlation to, the, to what drives price. And then we have a big consumer behavior modeling infrastructure because we have, what's nice is that over the, over the 30 years of our history, and then we purchased data that was probably 25 years old at the time, we can, we can measure how consumers behave to changes in their economic environment. And that consumer behavior will affect home prices and will affect performance on credit. It's that, the, so that's the core competency, and it's just leveraged into if it's a loan, if it's a security backed by a loan, if it's the actual real estate itself. So from a data perspective, think about it this way. So obviously the S&P 500 is 500 names, and they report four times a year. And God love the analysts that have to figure out how to price these things with so little information. We have 100 million items that we're following. There's 100 million pieces of real estate in the country. We've gathered up all the information you would need to do an appraisal, and we keep that information current in real time. And we've automated the, the appraisal process for valuation, both intrinsic value, meaning like where would we pay it, where would we uh, buy it, and where is the fair market price that asset. From that level, from price and from consumer behavior now, so now we're, we're watching the payments on every mortgage in the country. <clears throat> so you can see who paid, did Maryland do better than Texas last month? And more importantly, versus the model, who outperformed, who underperformed? Because there's a schedule, you know, there's an expectation for not everyone to pay every month. So when you're, you're trying to put a value on a home, you're not just sending a third party appraiser out to do a drive by and go, yeah, it's about 275. You're actually crunching a lot of numbers, and this is proprietary we're running data. A, we're running a 10-year Monte Carlo uh, that's probably 20,000, 10,000 paths of outcomes on that asset. It uh-huh. includes all of its changes in its property taxes, its, its depreciable life for the improvements of the assets, and then, of course, its revenue stream from rental demand. So, so it's interesting that you started this after the financial crisis. Given your technological expertise and your unique way to, to value these things, I'm curious how much of this is a legacy of your experiences during the great financial crisis. How did that couple of years affect how you look at risk and pricing of of real estate properties? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's on the it's it's infecting, I would say. So the problem mm-hmm. the problem for me, I'll speak for myself personally in the financial crisis is that once you find something like that because literally we were saying to people you know, these loans aren't going to pay off you know, in 2005, 2006. And they were like, Sean, you know, in the worst default rate, it's been 
geographically focused, right. whether it was the Farm Belt crisis or right. the California crisis. So what, what are you talking about? National home prices going down. And oh, by the way, the defaults in those micro markets were 10 or 15% and the losses were 5%. So if, if you had 5% losses on a, on a market and the market was only 5% of a pool, the losses are going to be nearly zero, right? And we're like, yeah, except for none of that's going to happen this time. And they were like, sure, Sean, pat you on the head and send you down the road. So so one of the problems is once you see something like that, you kind of look for them everywhere. <laughs> so we spent our time, a lot of time looking for uh, looking for Sasquatch. <laughs> and so the other thing is, is that, and I think it's our core risk management culture, is that we think that tiller risk is way more probable than everyone else does. Mm -hmm. So we manage the business for extreme shocks to prices, for home prices moving 25, 30% in a year, for interest rates moving dramatically in a short period of time. Um, and we found, you know, that- Check, check, check. It happens. All these tail risks. Well, it's like the 100 year floods. Every 10 years or so. Yeah, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've had how many 100 year floods? More than, more than 0.3. <laughs> you, you know, the fascinating thing is I have a vivid recollection of a paper, a white paper coming out by professors Reinhardt and Rogoff I never remember. It's, it was five financial crises. So it was um, Helsinki, it was Sweden, it was Japan, it was Mexico. Maybe U.S. in the Great Depression was the right. fifth one. I don't remember exactly what it was. By the way, that paper eventually becomes, yeah. this time is different, 800 years of financial folly. Right. But the average of the real estate drop in any modern financial, we're not talking about tulips, right. like the last century, uh, was over thirty percent in right. real estate, right. and once you once I saw that paper, I remember saying, "Hey, this isn't a theoretical possibility. This has happened yeah, the, the implies, in recent decades." Right. The, so people think of home prices as being sort of four or five percent price movers per right. annum, um, and that's the case most of the time. But the problem is we don't get to live most of the time. We get to live all the time, <laughs> and so so sometimes that five percent move can be thirty five percent or forty percent. So think about that eighty percent LTV mortgage. That doesn't seem like a risky loan. The borrower put up 20%, the lender put up 80%, but there's a one in something chance that the home price goes back to goes to 65. And if the home goes to 65, the loan is no longer going to pay off. So that was the that was the sort of the thing that we built that people hadn't thought through is how do you stochastically forecast a range of outcomes for the asset price then how does it affect the repayment risk on the loan? So so you have to have boots on the ground with 50,000 homes. Yeah. Um, how big a staff do you have? Is it regional? How, how do you manage, since since you're now the landlord for these homes, how do you manage the regular maintenance, the, the one-off, yeah. you know, things break, a refrigerator stops, the toilet gets backed up? H how do you manage that? Yeah, it's it's complicated. So we have a, a both of an on-balance sheet group of repairmen. So we're an investment management platform that also has trucks with plumbers cruising around the country uh, and fixing air conditioners. Um, we also have a, a, a great vendor network, and we have a lot of technology that the team, as you mentioned, is, is about 1,500 people that are just in that single family rental platform. This is one of the things Amherst does. But that 1,500 person team is augmented by about 2,000 vendors of so companies. Um, and we're able to handle the properties because we have a team in the field. So we literally have a, a repair and maintenance team that's assigned to a group of homes. So that person has their, their 300 homes or something. And then they're part of a local team that's managing about 1,500 units. So it's not that different from how you would manage a multifamily an apartment complex. It's just that the rooms are further apart, the units are further apart, uh, and it causes our drive times to be higher. But one of the things that we went into this, that was one of the big questions is, could you provide good service and could you manage it? And we don't get it right all the time. Um, but if you think about the fact that how easy it is to get someone out to a home, and that's part of our filtering criteria of how we buy a home, but think about the fact that for for 10 bucks, you can have Domino's bring you a pizza. And somehow out of that 10 bucks, they get the delivery person from their store to your home with a hot pizza. And they were able to pay for the Super Bowl ad out <laughs> in, embedded in that $10 cost. Like the transportation cost to get people to and from these homes, it just isn't a barrier. It's really timing and technology to really to route them. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about technology. Over the past, I don't know, two decades, mm -hmm. real-time monitoring of things like fire, flood, uh, carbon monoxide, break-ins, yep. whatever, yep. they become very inexpensive, very ubiquitous. Everybody can have, a, have it on a phone. Uh, uh, is that anything that you've explored in terms we of- We spend a lot of time on it. There's big privacy concerns. Yep. So we have families, we have 50,000 families living in their homes and they're their homes and we're 
proud to be part of that process. So, we, you know, a lot of that stuff gets a little creepy to us. And so we haven't done Well, there's it. We a difference deployed. between a puppy cam where you're seeing what's going on in the bedroom and... Right. Um, I know in my basement I have a uh, a, a flood yeah, like monitor. a high water alarm that right. sort of thing. So that but we're still on their network. We're still so that technology for us to go at it stronger. We would like for those devices to communicate back to us uh, directly, not like through, a wire, like a, like uh, a cell independent. Phone. So we are looking at the, there's locks now you can buy that have little cell phone uh, transmitters in them. Right. So we may we may look at things like that. But at this point we have so many people on the field. We're touching the houses six, eight, nine times a year. We have good relationships with our with our residents. A lot of that stuff is a little bit of pizzazz, and we see mm-hmm. you know there are people charging residents you know fifty dollars a month for an electronic door lock or something. We don't think that that's sustainable. Well, it's a fifty dollar product. How do you charge fifty dollars a month for that? I know. I don't. I don't. I don't get it. So it, we well, we'll it's coming along. If I can get direct cell phone connections to a high water alarm, I would take it. But really, what we have is a person go out there and look and touch the property eight times a year, and that's how we, that's how we do it. A lot of this is not so complicated, but we have you know through COVID was fascinating because that field team and we have a, a big construction management team. So these guys, those fifty thousand homes have all been renovated. So that those teams during COVID, man, they stood up and they went out and they made us so proud. They provided service to the residents. They finished construction jobs. They got homes back in service so people could move out of wherever they were and get into a home. Um, so it's been fascinating to watch this business run through a crazy COVID cycle and then a crazy post-COVID cycle and now an interest rate cycle. The, the team has had to be pretty nimble. Huh. Really quite, quite intriguing. Let, let's talk a little bit about, about your space what are you doing these days in mortgage-backed securities? Does that market exist remotely well, like it did in the 2000s? Well, it's great that you ask about it. So my the bulk of my career was spent in the mortgage-backed securities and structured products markets. The single-family rental business kept us very busy while the Fed was monetizing so many mortgages. So right. as you know, they own about a third of all mortgages that were ever issued. The relative value for for non-government investors was so bad that we wound down a lot of our capabilities in that space. We actually sold our investment bank to Banco Santander Uh as part of just the frustration with how much intervention had sort of driven down value in that space. Well, now that's completely reversed and there's a real vacuum today, a real vacuum. As the Fed stopped buying mortgages, they bought a third of the whole market. When they stopped buying them, I think the belief was that the market would get back to its regularly scheduled programming and the traditional investors would show up to buy them. And they didn't because a lot of those traditional investors don't exist anymore. You, you lose a whole generation, there's no succession yeah, and beyond this, that. This is the largest debt capital market in the world, the largest, most liquid, and there's it's lost its sponsor. So the sponsor went from being <clears throat> the big investment banks, the, the government agencies, the big bank balance sheets, a lot of the insurance company balance sheets, and the money managers, the Fed displaced all of them. Then they then they changed regulations to where the investment banks can't really step in. The agencies are no longer allowed to run balance sheets. The REITs are not really well positioned to, to step up in the size as we just saw in the fourth quarter. So there's a real lack of sponsorship for the assets and they become incredibly attractively priced. So we've we're so we've been ginning back up those strategies. We still we've always run strategies in that space, but they've been very sort of boring strategies, index tracking, index outperformance, that kind of thing. But now there's opportunity to really go in and build proper hedge fund strategies, proper total return strategies. The relative value is sort of startlingly attractive now. So I always hated the term financial repression, but what you're describing really is the Fed uh, engaging in financial repression on that corner of the market. Well, what I, what I would say is that they were investing for a non-monetary focus or motivation. Right, they didn't care what their return on the mortgages were. They, Price insensitive. They right, they cared what the lower mortgage rate did to the economy. So, as, as as a person that's just investing for an economic return, you can't compete with that, right? right? So their motivations were totally different, and they and they basically drove down the relative value to where on a on a hedge adjusted basis, if you looked at a mortgage and you sort of get it back to where it's got the same risk as a treasury, it was yielding almost half a percent less than a treasury. They normally yield half a percent more well, now they yield one percent more so the, in fixed income terms that's a lot so they're so now we're really focused on mortgages we're way more active than we have been in the past and we're excited about the opportunities there and, and we have a commercial mortgage lending strategy as well huh that that's kind of interesting so so let's talk a little bit um about what's going on in the commercial space um we were talking earlier about <clears throat> 60 minutes did a piece recently on the New York real estate market is never coming back, and all these big <laughs> office towers are, you know, empty. 
I'm old enough to remember the see-through office towers right. in Dallas back yeah. in the '80s, and, and Dallas, the whole right? the Washington Dallas corridor was full of see-through, right? Um, see-through buildings. So we're not there, but certainly the typical high-rise has you know a vacancy rate of 10, 15, 20 percent, and the occupancy rate during the day is probably another 10, 15 percent less than that. What what's going on in the office space so, market? So the the castle data. Is pretty fascinating, and you can get it on your Bloomberg terminal. The castle, the castle occupancy data, as we talked about before. A bar, a bar, but by the way, that's all swipe cards of employees literally going that's in and out of the real time physical yeah. occupancy data. It's pretty, and it's not perfect, like no data set is, but it's pretty startling. The last time I looked at it, most markets are peaking at fifty percent physical occupancy. Wow! Remember, I said before that in the mortgage market, in the residential mortgage market, a borrower can stop making payments, and it might be two years before the investor actually takes a loss, sometimes five years. Well, I think that same thing's been happening in commercial now for the last, you know, since 2021, is that physical occupancy is the leading indicator to economic occupancy. Economic occupancy is who's paying the rent. And, and corporate leases are of incredibly high credit quality, incredible, very few leases ever default. Um, those leases, however, are going to come due and the renewal rates are tragically, tragically low. So if you model out what's going to happen to the commercial space from an economic perspective, you don't have to be a wizard to figure out that that monetary or physical, fiscal or financial occupancy is going to track physical occupancy. Companies aren't going to be able to give back one for one as much space as they're not using because they've got this peak and load problem where everyone likes to come to work on Wednesdays, so you still need the space. But the quantum of space that people need has been reduced dramatically. And we're seeing it in that castle data. So, so it's a scary thing to do. But if you forecast that that the lease payments track the physical usage, meaning that what you're seeing today it's 15% vacancy because some leases expired and didn't get renewed, well, all of those leases that are being underutilized by half, if those don't renew or they renew at much smaller spaces, you could create 30, 40% physical or actually financial vacancy in the commercial space. Now. It's dangerous to forecast that far in the future because behavior can change. How much space do people need? What do they do about the fact they want their whole team to get together three days a week? So they do they just eat the space on the Mondays and Fridays? Um, some companies are never coming back. Some jobs are never coming back. So the way we look at it, we have some loans in the office space. We do feel like it's like bottom fishing time. You know, we're we're uh-huh. we're we're taking back real estate now. That is. $50, $60 a square foot space for big, beautiful buildings that need to be re- repopulated. Um, but the, so the way we think about it is this, is that occupancy is probably going to drop by a third, but it won't be a third for everyone, right? In some places it's going to go to zero and some guys, they won't they won't feel it. So the, asset selection becomes incredibly important. So there's a huge difference between the A-class buildings and, and the B and C-class. And I've heard people say, even within A, there's a big range. There's the super A stuff. You know, the mm-hmm. one Vanderbilt thing at 200 bucks a foot. Right. That you can't get enough of it, but a block away, some traditional commodity office space that's, that's, that's a little drafty, whatever. Right. It, you know, there, people just don't want it at any, at any price. So now that super A space is a very, very small fraction of the market. So it's not what happens there probably isn't going to be sort of impactful. Um, but we think that, you know, they're, they're, people have to adjust to a new normal of demand, like demand function for, for commercial real estate has come down. Now, this is, by the way, just another domino in a long series of what the Andreessen and Horowitz guys call uh, software eating the world. Right. This is technology eating real estate. And so if you look at this over a longer period of time, the way we think about it is that technology ate retail, and we all kind of saw it, right? It was Amazon killed the, the shopping mall. Um, Airbnb has eaten up a lot of hotel demand. And so technology matching a home to a to a, a rent or a leaser um, has eaten up a bunch of the hotel demand. Now work from home is eating is eating office. So we can we kind of have a playbook for how this goes, and it's not great. And all of these are technology enabled. Without tech, uh, you wouldn't be able to do this. the The ironic thing is, the uh, I love people discovered like screen sharing and. 2021. Right. That tech has been around for a dozen plus well, 15 years. I know. I think about the people that created Skype. They must be sort of jumping off a bridge somewhere because, you know, you couldn't give away Skype pre-COVID. And now now I don't even have calls on my phone, my office phone ever anymore. Everything happens over Teams or over 
over Zoom. So the behavior has changed so quickly. But but I think that you know the CEO from Cisco made a good point that the home has become the enterprise. And what he was saying is that Cisco is seeing people buying really sophisticated communications equipment for their homes because now they're they're pushing the they're pushing their use case high. So for us, it's it's also kind of fascinating. And this is a little bit about how the 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 single family rental trade has become so interesting. Is as people stop going out to the mall and they shop at home, as high speed communications allows them to stream at home, as delivery allows them to eat at home, right? There these real estate sectors are all seeing their demand dry up, the demand for usage. All of that demand is showing up in the home. It's showing up in that in that eighteen hundred square foot three bedroom home because and everyone's use case and demand for real estate's changing because they're spending so much more time there. So I kind of feel like a lot of those big technological shifts we're, we're post the peak of that. Like uh, I'm a big online shopper and I've kind of come to recognize there's certain things that you just can't buy online. Yeah, you I have, have a to, tough time with clothes and things. Cl- clothes right. is a perfect example. Right. Um, a lot of times you order certain things like it's hilarious. You think you're getting a four foot tall, you know, <laughs> lamp and this miniature, in, and I guess the photo is what the photo is. Yeah, there's just no uh, tape mail, yeah, yeah. tape measure next to it. But, but let me ask you about this because pre-COVID, you couldn't have convinced me I could buy groceries on an app. Oh, I was doing that. That yeah. that's easy. Now I don't think I would ever go back to grocery. In store. fact, Amazon began that when they bought Whole Foods. So think about what that means. That grocery store, that grocery store anchored retail. Ordinarily, the grocery store space was underwritten at a loss by the real estate developers right? because that was your magnet. Now it's your distribution hub. And there's no people. So what happens to the dry cleaner? What happens to the ice cream shop? What happens to the t-shirt shop? What happens to the travel agent? They, so, they have to adapt the same technology yeah. and do pickup and deliver. So, so e-commerce is changing like the footprint for a business. It's a dressable market. Um, and I, so I don't think this is over. I think that, that the pricing of it, kind of like we talked about, the loan starts, the loan defaults, and then two years later, someone takes a loss. Today, we're, we're CPI prints higher than people expected because owner equivalent rents is higher. That OER number was calculable four months ago. So the market does, it does isn't doing a good job of forecasting what it already, what pricing in what it already, what it already knows right. in many cases. Um, and I think that we're still in the repricing phase of real estate for a new a new type of demand. So some of the solutions to these are wholesale changes to the way we built out suburbia which is so car dependent if we were creating these more walkable communities like back in the andy griffith days it's fascinating suddenly you it's fascinating. have you have retail that's survivable because everything isn't getting your car and drive to target that's right or, or have target make a delivery exactly so we spend you think about how european cities work that's that's what that's how they're that's how they're designed so, so the question is, is that something we can build here? Is there an appetite for that? Is there so, financing so for that? I'm spending a fair amount of time on just that. Is is can you respond to this? Should you respond to it? Because as you said, like, you know, maybe this is a flash in the pan. If all the companies decide that employees have to come to work every day, then then these trends in occupancy will change and quantum of demand will change. Um, but I recently was given a book and I read it. It's a compendium of essays called "A City Is Not a Tree." It was written in 1965, and it was about this. It was about how how a city should work to optimize the uh, experience for its residents. And think of a city as a product. And so we give the speech to mayors when we're asked about sort of how we think about their city from a migration and investment perspective. And we try to tell people that a city is a product. So New York City is a product. Um, and the customers can choose a different product. Uh, and it's, it's a great product. It's one of the greatest products in the world. But like all customers, I mean, like all businesses, uh, in all product delivery systems, you have to freshen your product to keep your customers happy. And we see some cities doing that and some cities not doing that. So you have to modify. You can't just completely tear down and change. So so one of my favorite YouTube channels is this kind of wacky uh, Canadian expat who moved to Amsterdam, and it's called Not Just Bikes. And he talks about livable, walkable cities and how different countries um, – in Europe, do a better job of it, and how there are pockets of it in the U.S. Right. and and North America, but they're few and far between. It's yeah, really, I think uh, it's something we're spending time on because we're with our vertical integration of manufacturing homes, building homes, real estate development, the ability to monetize a home either as a sell to a consumer or a rent and have into an investor. It gives us the ability to think big about development, um, and I haven't seen anyone pull off yet. So the master plan community in the United States 
other than maybe the Woodlands in Houston, mm-hmm. very few of them are actually master planned for multiple product types, where you have office, medical, uh, civil, residential, entertainment, all kind of thought about together the way you would the way European cities were developed. But remember, Europe, like you said, you said a very key thing. <clears throat> European European cities were developed before the cars became ubiquitous. right. Thousand years. A lot of our cities stopped growing as core cities and started growing as these uh, suburban driven cities because of the car. And so this will be simple. This will be interesting to think if will you reverse? And this is something that global real estate investors are thinking about on a full time basis. There was a paper written about five years ago. I think it was put out by the research team Prudential, and it was all about urbanization. And all of the investment themes across our investor base, the biggest investors in the world, were very focused on urbanization as a global theme. And you could see it in Southeast Asia. You could see it all over China. You could see it, of course, has happened in the United States, where people left the small town to go to the big city. COVID may have reversed one of the largest global trends in investing in the last hundred years. It may have turned. It may have turned us from urbanization to to deurbanization. Uh, and the impact of that. Now, I don't, I'm, we're not calling that just yet, but it's probably one of the most important things that people can focus on. Are we going to shrink the size of these mega cities that all benefited from urbanization for the last, you know, sort of 50 years in the U.S., maybe the last 15 years in, in Southeast Asia? Uh, so it's an interesting time where the where the I wish I could say how it's going to turn out, but there is a the ball is bouncing around, and we need to understand which way it's going to land. Tell us about Main Street Renewal. What is that? So that's the operating platform for the single family rental business. That's our construction management, our real estate brokerage platform, our leasing platform, the customer service platform. So that's the brand name that the consumers see, that our part, their operating partners see um, for the whole vertically integrated single family rental strategy. That's basically analogous to the entire ecosystem of the mortgage market wrapped up under one, one corporate label. Huh. And we, we've been talking a lot about single family homes to be purchased and rented. A couple of years ago, 60 Minutes did a piece talking mm-hmm. about, hey, is private equity pushing out local buyers? Uh, I know you have an opinion on this. T- yeah. Tell us a little bit about yeah. your experience with uh, 60 Minutes. Sure, sure. So so first of all, I love 60 Minutes. I don't know if it's just because I'm finally old enough to age into their demographic, but I think it's one of the best news shows on television because in that 12 or 15 minute segment, they really can simplify a topic and make it, and make it understandable to everyone. Um, the topic of of where do we fit in the ecosystem of the single family housing market is what we're doing a good thing or a bad thing. Obviously, you know, I've got a couple thousand people that wake up every day and go to work. They don't think they're doing a bad thing. So, so I can tell you our perspective of it. I can kind of give you both sides of the argument and people can decide for themselves. I mean, part of the argument is that, that um, if, 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 if Sean buys the home or if Amherst buys the home, some family couldn't buy the home. Um, and it's true that that if we buy the home, no one else could buy the home. <laughs> I'll give you that part. Uh, now in the U S we track the home ownership rate. Over time, the home ownership rate has grown to sort of mid 60s and bobbled around. It got really, really high when we were giving away mortgages in 2007, and then it came back down. But that number is, has been a six handle for the last 50 years, right? So 60 something percent of people own their homes. The inverse of that number is the people that don't own their homes. So that number has, has been between 30 and call it 30 and and. 25% for a very long time. So that third of, 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 how, of families in the U.S. that rent their home rent for a myriad of reasons. One of the reasons that they rent is because they can't get a mortgage. And part of our bet in 2009 was that the group of people who are going to be locked out of the mortgage market is going to grow substantially, partially because the standards became higher and partially because student loans became kind of a predatory financial product. Mm-hmm. So uh, having a student loan makes it way, di- way more difficult to get a mortgage. So in this argument of are we buying a home that a family is not moving into, I, I put the paradigm in a slightly different way. When that home comes up for sale, a lot of families show up that want to live in that home. A group of those families show up and they can get a mortgage and they can buy the home. A group of those families show up and they can't get a mortgage. For that second group of families to get to live in that home, an investor has got to buy the home. And that investor can be, and historically has been very small investors, people that own one or two homes. Maybe they owned a home, lived there, moved away, kept it, rented it. Um, And now through through technology and through significant investment platforms like ours, allow larger investors to go and invest in that home. So when I sit down with policymakers and they're sort of of this mindset that, that I should have stayed away and let the family buy the home, what I like to do is say, look, can you guys just put together the pictures of these two families and who's going to get to live in that home if, if the only people who can get a mortgage can live there and who can live there if Sean buys the home? 
because demographically they look more like the people the people that get served by the home when i buy it look a lot more like the people the government should be trying to help and that usually takes people they step back and they go wait a minute what do you mean i'm like well so sean doesn't live in fifty thousand homes someone's living in there and the people that live in those homes for the most part are not candidates to get a mortgage in the 2024 mortgage standards uh, and, and it's not because they don't have a jobs and they aren't currently they're paying two thousand dollars a month in rent our average customer only pays 25 percent of their income in rent for two thousand dollars they cover everything they cover the the chance that the ac breaks they don't have to pay for that property taxes insurance the whole nine yards so right now the cost to rent is probably 30 percent cheaper than the cost to own but more importantly if you're not given a chance to get a mortgage it doesn't matter what the cost to own is. The cost for you is infinite because you're not allowed to get a mortgage. So when they when Dodd-Frank passed and the standards for mortgage credit became unfairly high, we said, okay, this is what's gonna this is what the nation has decided it wants to do. Now, against my advice, when I sat when I sat at the Federal Reserve, I said this doesn't have to happen this way. We can sort out for you what the good subprime was from the bad subprime. People were like, We agree, you can, but that's not how policy works that mortgage market has been shut down and it's gonna stay shut down. So so what should we do to reopen that mortgage market for people who are currently employed, okay. have a half decent credit now, record? Now you're baiting, we're gonna need the two hours for the podcast. I got yeah. a whole list of things we need to do. But the Go, pr- give, give us a short first. The, 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 primary, the primary thing you have to do is you have to put risk, you have to make risk-based pricing legal in the US mortgage system. Dodd-Frank made risk-based pricing illegal. So, so if someone comes in with a lower credit score, a higher likelihood of default. And remember, the likelihood of default could mean that they go from being 5% likely to 10% likely, not 90% likely. But if someone comes in that uh, that has a likelihood of default above a certain level, the answer is you can't make them the mortgage. At any price. At any price. As opposed to where it's, let, I'll make up a round number, if we're at 5%, they could buy get a mortgage at six and three we used quarters. To charge, we used the, the rate used to be three points higher, two points higher. Mm-hmm. So Dodd-Frank basically carved out the maximum premium you can charge to anyone. And then they created recourse for the borrower. So I give this presentation in the UK and I gave this presentation in France once. And I said, okay, the US passed, they were like, why is the demand for rental so high? And I said, well, but people can't get mortgages. And they said, why? And I said, well, Dodd-Frank created a precedent that said that if I lend you money to buy your home, and then you can't pay me back, you can sue me. And even in France, the guy would say, no, 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 you mean the other way around. I lend you the money, you don't pay, I can sue you. And I'm like, no, no. So there's, there's this concept that, that, that was part of the, the ether in the financial crisis that the banks were the proximate cause for the default. And so the bank should not be allowed to make these loans. There that's, were some bad that's, actors. That's a wild statement because as someone literally wrote a book on this, banks did a bunch of stuff that wasn't very smart, but it's hard to say the banks making loans were the proximate cause. Now there's a handful of banks doing the ninja stuff, and but that was there really- There was enough bad acts to go around. The yeah. banks had culpability. The securitization industry had culpability. Well, there's a lot the more- serving on The serving industries had, had culpability. The ratings agencies- The rating agencies forget. had culpability. And this is what I spent time in Washington trying to explain to people. But the consumers had culpability as well. Sure. So a lot of people with fraudulent loans, six, seven, eight loans. So we bought a bunch of these loans. Uh, something people don't know is that we audited 80,000 loan contracts that we bought. And we there's a return to sender clause in mortgage contracts that most people don't know about. Right. And if the borrower defaulted and the contracts were in a certain way, the person that sold you a loan has to buy it back. So in these eighty thousand loans, you kind of had sort of two big populations of of predatory borrowers. Uh, one were the little mini we call them the little mini Donald Trumps. They would have like twenty five or thirty or forty homes, no equity down. They're all rented, no management kind of like YOLO of like, if they go up, we're going to refinance them. If they don't, we're going to send the keys back in. And these were loans that were made with no equity from the borrower, 80% first, 20% second investor loans. Um, and then then there were a group of people who really just wanted a house and they were willing to fib about their financial standards to get there. Right. And so, and the banks and the mortgage originators in many cases, there's 80,000 files. You would open up the file and it would say the person was a dental hygienist and made $100,000 a year. And no that, documentation. And that loan was, loan was approved. No, in the same file would be the application that got denied that said that they were a dental assistant and they made $50,000 a year. So they would give us the file that... <laughs> so, so, they would, so those were the... I heard stories at the time of the mortgage brokers who 
we're able to guide an applicant through coaching, and say, coaching no, no, don't this. write this. Don't write, here's what you got to say. <laughs> Absolutely. And basically, you know, we're, we're co-conspirators well, to the, fraud. And, you know. The uh, mortgage broker was making 5 or 6% of the loan amount. Right. It's a lot of incentives. So, so, so I blame them much more than the person who just did what they were told. Like, they were wrong. At this but point. But really, the professional is the one right, you got to hold accountable. At this point, I think that we're hung up on who to blame, not you and me. But if the market is hung up on who to blame, and the market isn't paying attention to who got harmed. Right. Because the in the first degree, the person that got harmed was the person who, who got foreclosed upon and got evicted from their home. That's a very clear harm to see. The harder harm to see is the maybe 8 million families that haven't been able to buy a home since this law went into And it's action. 15 years later. It's fit, And there's no progress. So the rental market has to grow. Institutional capital is going to play a, a part in every home transaction. Institutional capital has to be there to make the loan if, if they're not going to buy the home. Providing service to the third of American families who rent for various reasons. Now, about a third of our customers or 20% of our customers move out every year. So they were never like long-term committed to that location to begin with. The, the credit scores of our customers suggest, and the financial condition of our customers suggest it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for them to get a mortgage on average. So this is the solution for people to move out of. The, the, the other thing people think about is that it's okay to rent apartments. So that's socially acceptable right, right. to invest in apartments and rent them. But apartments are primarily one and two bedroom products. So we're a three bedroom product. So as you age out of an apartment, or you need more space because you work from home or you have a family or whatever, and you age into the single family product, which is location driven, local amenities driven, blah, blah, blah. Traditionally, you would go and get a mortgage and buy. But that cross section of the customer base that the mortgage market serves has shrunk so much that we set up this platform because we knew they were coming. We knew that they're gonna wanna live in that product and they're gonna need to get there with a different financial solution than a mortgage. So we developed an institutional scale securitized financing vehicle for the pool of homes. We developed the services that wrap around the pool of home to lower its cost of capital. So the cost of capital for single family rental today is in the five, five and a half percent range. Prior to us getting involved, the cost of capital for rental was probably 800 over, 900 over because it was provided by small investors taking very specific location risk. Now we can have a thousand homes. The, all the idiosyncratic risk is pretty much gone. So we feel very proud of what we're doing. And I wish that the, the conversation about this crowd out would be feel, focus more on the specifics of who didn't get to buy, but who got to live there. And when people see that and they see that, oh, wait a minute, you know, these are $300,000 homes. Or these are not, you know, these, these are homes that that bar, that resident would have a very difficult time getting into without us. And we were able to provide a really good service. Uh, at a very effective price for that customer base. That's a really interesting answer to a complicated question, and it, it still leaves open the problem that there are eight million people that are might otherwise be be, in, be, be homeowners, but uh, the rule change has pretty and, much and the way I think about it, out. the way I, you'll get me on a soapbox, but in the worst of the worst mortgage pools that we were short in the in the in the, the dirtiest of the pools with a. Everybody was lying. The borrower, the banker, the securitizer, the agent, everybody was lying. The worst of the worst. About 35% of the loans defaulted, which means that two thirds of even those dodgy things paid. So those are two thirds of those families got to get on the economic ladder and own a piece of America because the, the third worked out so poorly, we shut out the two thirds. And that's kind of the frustration I, I had with Washington is like, guys, like I know there's the throw the baby out with the bath or whatever, but you're throwing out you're throwing out an opportunity for people to own a piece of the country and act as owners in their community because you don't have a good way to manage the ones that don't work out. So we should be focused on what to do when they don't work out. We shouldn't prohibit the activity because some of it doesn't work out. Well, Congress seems to have its act together. I'm sure they'll work oh, I'm all. sure it's next this'll, on the docket. Right. This will this'll all be worked out. <laughs> All right, so I only have you for uh, a limited amount of time. Let, let's jump to our favorite questions. We ask all of our guests, starting with, what have you been entertained with these days? Tell us what you're either watching or listening to. Oh, wow. So I'm a very boring person. I spend a lot of my time uh, buried in, in data and analytics. I think that uh, I really love the whole Yellowstone series. I'm upset that Costner backed out because I thought the production quality was so good. So I've seen all of the the pre, the you know, the, the prequels and so forth. So on the entertainment side, I, I think that streaming has set a whole new bar for, for quality of, of programming. Yeah, no, it's a, that's absolutely on my list. Uh, tell us about your early mentors. Who might have helped shape your career? 
Um, wow. Well, so I've got a big family. I'm one of five kids. Uh, my parents were serial entrepreneurs. Uh, I've got four big sisters, and so they, they're all successful in, in various ways. And so the family has always been the primary motivator and, and leaders. Um, you have to, in, this, in our business, you know, in finance, who you marry really matters. So I've been married for 28 years. My wife was in finance. She ran an investment management business, built it up and sold it. So having, uh, having support at home and having a real partner in the business is super, super important. Our jobs, when you're the founder of a business, you know, the hours are long and the mental exercise is significant. So, so having the right teammate at home is, is absolutely paramount. Um, I, I, was, I had a, a high school economics teacher who later went, went to work for the Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas named Sandy Hawkins, who was just fantastic for a high school economics teacher. She covered everything from Milton Friedman to, to free lunches uh, in a way that made it fun for high school kids. And I absorbed every second of that I could. And then I had this really unusual situation because I was at this brokerage firm when I was very young and mortgages were just getting some science around them. And I was always good at math and, and I had been writing code since I was in the sixth grade. Um, so I had real support around Wall Street because at the time there was a small club of, of firms that were helping solve this problem together. And so I had a, a, a guy named Frank Gordon who ran mortgage research at First Boston that was just a great support to kind of bring me up, up the learning curve. Huh, interesting. Uh, tell us about some of your favorite books and, and what have you been reading recently? Well, I mentioned I read A City Is Not a Tree. It's, it's a little bit boring, but it's fascinating because I do think that there's an opportunity for us to rebuild micro cities. Um, so instead of, instead of going to the, the exurbs and trying to adjoin a city, I do think there's a, something that we're working on to just plop in the middle of nowhere and build a, a full stand-up city, which would be fascinating. Um, I, my my daughter and I listen to Crime Junkies on the, on the entertainment side. I think it's one of the most popular, other than yours, of course, one of the most popular podcasts in the country. It's fascinating. It's a uh, it's a couple of young women that that tell the story of uh, of some sort of unsolved mystery or solved mystery of, of real time. Uh, what do they call it there? It's a, it's the real crime dramas. I think so it's been pretty fascinating. And I've got we have two kids. So my wife and I have have uh, a freshman at Columbia and a sophomore at Stanford. So we're spending a lot of time uh, learning about the college experience. Freshman at Columbia. Oh, so you're by, you're back and forth. But my poor uh, wife is on like the coast to coast tour. Are you uh, are you guys in Austin a lot? Are yeah, you... home is in Austin. Home so in Austin. so you're halfway. So it worked out exactly. Way. We're equally. We're, it's equal travel to either place. And uh, so our final two questions: What sort of advice would you give a recent college grad interested in a career in mortgages, real estate? Uh, CRE, any, anything along those lines? Yeah. So when, whenever we have interns come in or we have young executives start, um, I buy them a couple things. So I buy them the, the Frank Fabozzi handbook on mortgage-backed securities, the, the mortgage-backed nerds Bible. Um, and, we, and I buy them a book, Bernstein's book, called Against the Gods. And I really think that, and maybe it's just because I'm such a quant nerd, but I think that Against the Gods, it's a very small book, a, a very quick read, um, but it does a really good job of teaching people that you can apply quantitative analytics and probability theory to almost anything and to everything, to your life decisions, to everything. And I think it provides a nice paradigm in a world where today it feels like because of the political environment, people are sort of it's black or it's white, it's zero or it's one, and it's never zero or one, right? right. There's always some difference in between. Um, so that's, that's a book that I think is sort of required reading at Amherst to really understand the history of risk management, the history of probability theory, how it first turned into, what are the big mispricings have been. So I, it's, not a, it's not a super complicated read, but I think it does a really good job of taking people from thinking about the world as trying to predict a thing instead of saying, wait a minute, there's a range of things can I be okay with a broad array of outcomes versus just betting on that one thing? And pretty much everything Peter Bernstein writes is great. It's awesome. The gold, the gold one's even good, too. And our final question, what do you know about the world of real estate investing today? You wish you knew 30-so years ago when you were first getting started. Wow. Um, that's fascinating. The, the ecosystem of real estate has been hard for me to follow, coming at it from the fixed income markets. So just understanding the various players and what they do and how they're motivated has been something I wish I would have just sat down and mapped out early on because understanding how people are sort of economically uh, rewarded really helps you predict their behavior. And I was kind of confused by that for a long time, trying to pick the thing that was the right answer instead of the thing that would have benefited the most people. It's like in the financial crisis. We were, we were um, short uh, countrywide uh -huh. in, in scale. 
hundreds of millions of dollars. And Bank of America bought them. And but like, for like next to nothing though, right? Well, but but yeah, but it was worth less than nothing. <laughs> right? And so zero was a good out, was a good outcome for that thing. So at, so at that point we realized that the consequence of countrywide failing was was so great that the system was going to find an alternate outcome. So we, we switched our thesis at that point to understand that the value of an asset might have more to do with the consequences of that asset failing than the asset's actual probability of failing. And that's something I wish I would have figured out before because it was so, like So that. you and I could go down this rabbit hole because we were short CIT, we were short Lehman, we were short AIG, and AIG similarly too systemically important yeah. couldn't be allowed to, to crash and burn. But what was so fascinating was, okay, how come Lehman Brothers was left out to fall on its face uniquely yeah. amongst the giant financial yeah. players? And I have a pet theory, which I've never been able to validate anywhere. People forget. You know, um, uh, Warren Buffett very famously made a loan to Goldman Sachs sure. that at very advantageous prices, got yep. a nice piece of Goldman Great bit of business for Berkshire Hathaway. What people forget is a few months earlier, he had offered that deal to Dick Fold. Right. And Dick Fold said, what is this old man trying to do? Steal the company? <laughs> Tell him to go jump. And once you turn down Warren Buffett, how can the Treasury Department or the Fed yeah. write a, you know, a, all right, we're going to bail you out of a couple yeah. hundred billion dollars? Because yeah. you, you, you had a chance to save yourself, but you waited for us. It's super complicated. We were a little bit on the outside looking in on that deal. We did price Lehman. We priced Morgan Stanley for a lot of different investors. We priced Bear Stearns. Uh, the magnitude of the losses was hard to get your head around. But it felt like the capital markets had it about right. So when Bear Stearns was sold, their uh, CDS was trading 35 points up front for the senior unsecured piece. So it's meant that the bond portion of their capital structure had about a $65 recovery. If you marked a market Bear Stearns, that was about right. But the consequence of wiping out the equity would, would, would had effects that we couldn't even, years later, I figured out what the effects were. But like the, the you know, it's kind of like the old Annie Hall, like there's what they're saying and then there's what's in the subtitles. Right. Like the macro of who owned the equity, who was gonna get crammed down, who owned the fixed income, who was gonna end up with control. Like there was a much bigger, and that's what I'm trying to say about what to learn is that the first instance of what you see of something probably is a fraction of the story. Like For it, sure. It, it, and, and and if you remember, oh, you have a weekend to figure this out. We, yeah. we expect a deal before yeah, these, markets these, open these Monday. These trillion dollar balance sheets right. are full of complex illiquid assets and you have a weekend. So so it was, It's. So I think that's the thing is like, it's probably never as obvious as it looks um, would be one advice and, and to understand the whole ecosystem, not just one assets uh, you know, sort of risk profile. Huh. Well, Sean, thank you for being so generous with your time. This has been absolutely fascinating. We have been speaking with Sean Dobson. He is the chairman, chief executive officer, and chief investment officer at Amherst Group, managing uh, about $16.8 billion. If you enjoy this conversation, well, be sure and check out any of our previous 500 or so. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Check out my new podcast, At The Money, 10 minutes of conversation about earning, spending, and investing your, your money with, with an expert. You can find that in the Masters in Business feed or wherever you get your favorite podcast. Uh, sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on what's left of Twitter at Ritholtz.com. Follow all of the Bloomberg family of podcasts at podcast. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps us put these conversations together each week. Kaylee LaPara is my audio engineer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Paris Wald is my producer. Sean Russo is my head of research. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.